Well, <clears throat> um, okay, so I hope you've come to some sort of uh, conclusion about what you think the top three are. And, and maybe, maybe on reflection you're choosing what the top three ought to be, and it may not be the top three that actually in your school or organisation you actually follow. But the top three, according to um, uh, Vivian Robinson, and I've, I've given the reference to the paper, uh, you can actually download this. Um, I think you probably have to pay $25 for it, but anyway, it's downloadable. Number three was establishing goals and expectation. Number two was planning, coordinating, and evaluating teaching and the curriculum. And number one? Creating educational powerful connections. Promoting and participating in teaching, learning, and development. <coughs> so, um, now, now look, this, this was the message from Vivian Robinson as an outcome of this research. And by that first one, we mean leadership that not only promotes, but directly participates with teachers in formal and informal professional learning. Question, if, you've, if you're organizing some professional development within your school, how often do you as the head go along for all of it? Or do you have something more important to do? If you have something more important to do, it's sending a message to your teachers. The second one, direct involvement in support and evaluation of teaching through provision of formative and summative feedback to teachers. Hmm? This is about engaging with them to support and evaluate teaching. Do you have a system within your school of, for example, peer observation of classes? Or, in your school, does one teacher not allow another teacher to go in? And, and have you trained teachers to go into each other's classes to observe and to give positive and sometimes negative feedback, but to give feedback. And thirdly, includes the setting, communicating and monitoring of learning, of learning goals, sorry, standards and expectations, and the involvement of staff and others in the process so that there is clarity and consensus about goals. In other words, how do you set targets and how do your teachers set targets? And are they challenging and are they achievable? Or is it always the fault of the student if the targets are not achieved? When we started doing this in my college, if there, were, uh, if there was a great set of results in a subject, the teachers would be preening themselves and saying, aren't we good? And if there was a poor set of results, the teachers would be saying, God, but it was that group of students. God, hopeless. Hmm? Now, now, now what, what, what we did in, in my place was we, we had um, uh, value-added analyses over time so that we could look to see how well the youngsters were performing. And we had, we had some uh, subject areas where every year the youngsters were performing better than the national average for youngsters with their previous scores. And we had some that were performing around the national average. And we had some that performed below the national average. And in one year, you could have a swing. But where you had evidence over three or four years that a department was continually producing results less good than comparative uh, departments in, in other schools, then it was a clear indication 
that it wasn't the fault of the students, it was the fault of the teaching. And, and my question to leaders would be, <clears throat> are there any departments in your school where you would not want your own child to be a, uh, a student, a learner? And if you wouldn't want your own child to be taught by a particular department or a teacher, then why should you allow other children to be taught? So there's, there's challenging stuff. But it is about leadership, and it is about setting the context for young people to get on, because you're, you're setting that for the rest of their lives. And look, that means that leading, teaching, and learning is the key task of us who have had the privilege to be leaders of schools and colleges. And now, <clears throat> um, I, I just want to share with you some of the learning, so to speak, that I've done over the last um, few years. Um, uh, latterly, so to speak, as principal of the college, and more recently, as senior education advisor for Cambridge International, um, because I have the privilege of visiting different countries. And uh, last September, I, uh, 12 months ago, I was in Argentina, because there's a group of schools in Argentina um, who offer the Cambridge curriculum, and they, they share. It's, it's a great example, really, of schools sharing, because they have an organization called ESARP, which stands for English-speaking schools of the River Plate, around the River Plate. So, or maybe it's along the river, anyway, it doesn't matter, ESARP. And they have a conference every two years, and I was privileged to go and speak, but also to, to sit in and listen. I'll tell you a little story, which um, uh, they certainly won't broadcast, um, that initially Cambridge said to me, we want you to go for one day and do your speech. And that was a bit like the head teacher dropping in, and, and I said, I can't do that, because I want to place what I say in the context of what the delegates have heard. So they had to pay for me to go for three days, not one day, but anyway. But, but I mean, that, that, that is that's a, 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 an important message about the leader engaging and understanding what's going on. So there were two young women from the University of Buenos Aires who were in the neuroscience uh, faculty and they presented some of their results. And um, I, maybe I should have known this, but I didn't. So they were looking at uh, monkeys and they were looking at the size of the brains and they showed that in the first three months, between three weeks and three months, the size of the brain, the mass of the brain increased and they attributed this to the formation of neurons in, in those important uh, early, early uh, days of, 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 of any life. And then after three months, it no longer grew. For the, 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 the mass of the brain remained constant. But then they looked at the volume of the brain. And over the first three weeks, as the mass grew, then so did the volume. Surprise, surprise. But over the next three years, the volume of the brain increased further, although the mass didn't. Now, what's that due to? Any, any thoughts? Sorry? Did you, did you say capacity? Density. density. No, no. Well, well um, uh, no. If, well, density decreasing. Yeah, density decreasing. Okay, but why? Capacity. The capacity. Okay, well, that, that's, I mean, are there any neuroscientists here? Any biologists? Who, ha, hands up if you're a biologist. Is, Is 
Yeah, okay, excellent, thank you. It's to, it, their conclusion, as yours is, was that um, there was a growth in the number of synapses, the genesis of synapses, the connections being made between the neurons, pushing them apart. And they went on to say that the generation of synapses is building the memory. That's how our memory develops. And the model is that neurons uh, link up. And, and where you get a link, then that's a synapse. And they said there are active neurons and, and inactive ones. And actually, in the active ones, what was happening is that more synapses between the two neurons were being developed. And that's about embedding memory. It's about creating more links. It's a bit Ozubelian. It's about uh, hanging new hooks on old hooks. And, um, and uh, uh, in the inactive, uh, so, okay, so there's a, 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 a bigger synapse being created with greater volume, but um, uh, no extra mass. And actually, you forget things if it's inactive. Look, these ones at the bottom suddenly lose their connections because you you know you you've forgotten it. You may have been, you may have known it you know for a short time, then you forget it. So there's a message in here for how we learn. Um, and and when we're teaching our young people, indeed when we're learning ourselves, we are generating synapses. But look, it happens um, through repetition. And so, look, that's, that's my first little message. That was my learning when I was in Argentina. And the second thing I just want to talk about is something that um, I, I began to develop in, in, um, in Farnborough. We were talking about depth of learning over time. And you sort of think, don't you, that over time, your depth of learning increases in a, in a sort of linear way. I mean, you know, that felt OK. Um, and if you have two independent variables, let's say depth of learning and sense of achievement, in a now a three-dimensional space, can you see, there's, there's my resultant. I hope you can see it, the red one going up in, in, in that plane between depth of learning and time, yeah? And we've now got in the horizontal plane a uh, sense of achievement increasing with time. And so you have a resultant between the two of them, yeah? And um, you sort of, you, we tend to think uh, that you could represent that on a sheet of paper. So there's a sheet of paper in the, in the three-dimensional plane, and, and we've got um, uh, a resultant coming up the middle. And then I read about catastrophe theory by a man called René Thomas. Any mathematicians who've done anything on catastrophe theory? Because you'll know it better than me as a mathematician. Anyway, look, catastrophe theory says, um, actually, life isn't like that. It says, life is full of cusps. So it's not a sheet of paper. It's a, a sheet of paper with a cusp in it. Hmm? So on this side, you've got linearity. And on this, I, my piece of paper really isn't big enough. But on, on the other side, you've got a cusp. And um, what, what catastrophe theory says is this. Um, so I'm going now in reverse. If you've got two variables, then uh, they, they could have, it could be possible that there's a linear relationship. As you change the two variables, then it goes down the piece of paper. But they say, René Tom says, actually, life isn't like that. You get, uh, it's more likely that the changes will take you into what he calls a metastable area. This bit over the cusp. And as further changes happen, 
suddenly you get to the position where you have a catastrophe. And it's, it's most commonly unexpected. You've allowed things to change and then suddenly something goes wrong. Now, I've said here, look, so the University of Exeter a few years ago closed its chemistry department. It was a shock to everybody. It was a good chemistry department, but suddenly it closed because they didn't have enough students and they didn't want to invest any more money, so they closed it. But once you've closed it, you can't reopen it next year because of all the resources involved. So uh, uh, um, the bank, Lehman Brothers, uh, everybody thought it was safe. All of a sudden, catastrophe one day. What? Lehman Brothers is closing? So it's a catastrophic change. And um, look, in leadership, we all need to, uh, <laughs> to be aware of that. Because, you know, th th there can be a tendency to let things, it, it's okay. It, um, and, and suddenly you can have something where there's a catastrophe. Often, often maybe in terms of people's behaviours, you know. Somebody loses it. Um, uh, so, but look, I want to look at it in the other direction. And I want to suggest that there's something about depth of learning... Uh, which um, is the reverse, going in the re reverse direction. Because youngsters, uh, uh, when they're introduced to a subject, we were talking about it with some colleagues earlier, about the difference between IGCSE and A-level. Um, uh, saying IGCSE is, is a lot more straightforward than is A-level. And, and, and some youngsters find it very difficult. Uh, I've, said that the wrong way around, I'm sorry, that A-level is very much more difficult than IGCSE. And why is there such a, 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 a gap? And th th there's something about here where youngsters need to understand that this happens, yeah, as you're moving from IGCSE to A-level, but as you're moving from one uh, difficult situation to another in life, that um, it gets a bit tough and you're trying to climb up the underside of the cusp. And youngsters fall off. They can give up. And what we need to do is to support them to get over the cusp so that they're up, they're moved from the shallow learning to deep learning. And, and uh, that's about resilience. It's about the reflective learning. It's about enabling under youngsters and teachers to understand that, look, this is a natural process. That whereas we might want everything to be linear, actually life isn't like that. So we're supporting youngsters in, um, in that move through a difficult change. Um, and, oh, I nearly forgot to show you my catastrophe machine, um, which would have been a disaster. But just to try and show you what I mean by the cusp, um, uh, here I've got a disc, elastic band, and as I, as I move round here now, um, it's moving very slowly, and as I pull, it's very slowly, I'm just pulling, and then suddenly, it swings. The other way, I'm pulling. I'm pulling. So this is going down the slope. We get to the metastable area, and suddenly it swings round. So this is my catastrophe machine. I <laughs> brought it on the aeroplane. They made me get it out of my case. And the man behind me said, are you a magician? <laughs> I said, no. But, but it's, it's, quite, it's just quite interesting to understand that little changes can result in a significant um, uh, impact. Um, God, I'm glad I didn't forget to use it, or else I'd have been very disappointed. Um, so, so what I'm saying here is, look, think in terms of synaptogenesis, the building of the memory to enable the young people to overcome the difficulty. The brain needs to be active 
it's no good, and youngsters need to know this, it's no good going into a, 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 an AS level class and thinking that they don't need to do any work in between. Yeah, they're, they're actually building their brain. They're building their memory. And I was discussing this with the vice principal of my former college just, just last year. And he said, uh, he thinks that, memory, that learning goes a bit like this. That, that it's sort of okay, and then suddenly it dips before it can recover. And, and sometimes he says he associates this with a closed mindset, a fixed mindset. The youngster thinks they can't do it, so they can't do it. And the teacher thinks this youngster can't do it, so he won't do it, or she won't do it. And the open mindset is about saying, okay, well, growth is possible here. And, and, and that is about taught resilience and support. So, so I'd just like to bring Vince's ideas and my uh, catastrophe theory ideas together. So advice to a learner. Look, if you're serious about wanting to learn and you don't pay attention, your brain won't remember anything. And look, your brain attends to things which it sees repeated with perhaps a 10 minutes break between. In order to make those new synapses, you have to, you have to give positive messages and <laughs> be interested or fool yourself into thinking you're interested to repeatedly go over something. That's, oh, God, I can't be bothered. No, make yourself do it. There's, that's an element of learning. Um, and let them know that learning is the formation of synapses. Let them try to understand it. Permanent synapses involve growth and movement of cells, which takes time, sometimes up to six weeks. to So youngsters need to know that, and teachers need to understand that if they're developing their, their memory, because um, this is about learning, it's, it, it's too simple to say it's not about knowledge. Actually, it is about knowledge. And having got the knowledge, you can then build the links. So the growth continues only if you stimulate the pathway by trying to remember what you learnt. So review your notes same day, same week, same month. Um, so uh, under, this, is, this is what we, we used to say to our youngsters at Farnborough. Understand, fairly obvious. You know, record notes accurately in a way which suits your particular style of learning. Try as far as possible to use your own words to describe something. Because if you can't use your own words, it probably means you don't understand it. Learning parrot fashion is not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about building the memory so that actually you can then express it. Memorize. Probably the single biggest problem that causes poor grades. In a sense, you need to learn your work off by heart so that you can use that information. In an exam situation, you cannot expect your brain to cope with the questions and try to make sense of half-remembered facts. What happens is that panic sets in and you go blank. That skill needs practice. The more you do it, the easier it becomes. So, you know, often say, students say, well, my, I just went into that and my mind went blank. Why? Well, because actually you didn't know the stuff. Apply. And you, this says now and only now to pass the exam. Otherwise, you depress yourself. If you try to do the exam questions, so to speak, without being surrounded by books to help you, if you try to do the exam questions without having the knowledge, you can't do it. It's depressing. So those first three bits are really important. And look, we say only use conjunctions. Phase out bullet points. Because what we're trying to do is to get people to think from here to there through links. 
And if it's just bullet points of trying to remember, then that's more difficult. So we want to produce uh, youngsters thinking in terms of conjunction and, you know, but. So, um, so I, what I've tried to do here, look, <clears throat> is to go through the, imp the importance of teaching and learning and um, uh, the notion of occurring, but the importance of leadership in teaching and learning to enable good outcomes for youngsters. I've tried to say something about how to learn or how we in Farnborough enabled young people to learn so they got great outcomes. Um, and it's about getting on. And then I'm going to say, no, it's not like that. But it is about the importance of learning and the notion of the curriculum and the importance of leadership and how to learn in order to get on. It's not bullet points. This is about coherence and conjunctions, linking one thing with another. And look, if, if young people uh, face those difficulties and clamber over that cusp and begin to understand that that's part of the learning process and you can engage them in it, then our experience is that you get great results and you prepare young people for the life that does not yet exist. Um, and I think that's probably all I wanted to say. So, um, Simon. <clears throat> Do you want to just um, open it up now to any questions, and then we can yep. invite Tarek up there? Okay. So. Uh, well, look. Uh, I mean, look. Some of that stuff is a bit controversial. So, 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 please come back at me. Uh, I mean, um, this is about engaging in conversation. But what? What? what any? Any thoughts? I'm very relaxed about silences. So, um, look, why don't you just have a, just have a chat yourselves for, for half a minute. You can throw glasses around if you wish. But just, and just see if anything comes up from the discussion among yourselves at your table. Feel that one, yep. Well, look, um, uh, someone has just asked me a question, which was, so it's all very well, but um, what about league tables and uh, the position of schools in the league tables compared with other schools and the pressure, therefore, to teach to the test. Um, how does that square with this approach? And I suppose I would say there are, there are two responses. The, the, first, the first is that if you haven't got, so to speak, termly summative assessments, 
in the form of modules, then you can actually spend more time on the understanding and the learning of the subject than if you're preparing somebody for a test every term. So that's, that's one answer to it. And I think in your booklet, which is um, uh, modular to linear, um, I think you'll find something like that in there. But I guess my, my other response would be um, have confidence because in my experience anyway, once we as a college began to engage the whole staff in these sorts of discussions about how we enable people to learn, the results got better. And I can just show you here. Um, I mean, one of the things is get students to share their experiences. Um, and we actually had a, a review of learning behaviours sheet. And you can't, you probably can't read it from there, can you? I'm not sure whether I can. Um, okay, manage your feelings so that you stay motivated. You know, and then the students have to answer this. Do you always do that? Usually, sometimes, not often. How are you going to improve? Check your understanding of work from previous lessons. Um, uh, do you always do that? Usually, sometimes, or never. Uh, concentrate hard in the lesson, e.g. by listening, asking questions. How often? And, and how are you going to improve this? Now, what, what are youngsters, once they're given the, 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 the pointers to what, what it was that they ought to be doing, and then they're asking themselves, well, how often do I do that? then they become a bit more honest about their learning. Um, but the one I want to get to is this. Uh, here. Because this is a real group um, who, who, were, uh, who were doing this exercise as a sort of test to see whether we could effect improvement. So, so it's a pilot study. I mean, I wouldn't want to claim any more than that for this group. But it was led by Vince Scanella. So uh, we've got the names of the youngsters and their minimum grade, that was based upon their, their previous IGCSE scores. We worked with, with Alps and with um, uh, Alice which, uh, to, to, to say, look, based on your previous IGCSE performance, this is, what, this is the grade we would expect you to get. The, the minimum grade that we'd want you to get, not a target, the floor upon which you stand, we want you to do better. And then this was the AS grade that the youngsters got. So you can see that mostly the AS grade uh, was pretty much the same as their anticipated grade. Andrew did well there, look, uh, towards the bottom. Anyway, but then there was a, a, a module following, following working like this. And these were the individual results of, that's Melissa, here's Hannah, this is A2 now. Holly, Amy, Kieran. Kieran moved from a regular C to a B, and that 93 was not far from an A. Uh, Florence, look, dear old Camille, he did brilliant, brilliantly. Once he understood what it was he was supposed to be doing. Um, Alistair, I don't know what happened to Alistair, because he's the only one, I think, whose results were, were, were less good. See, Nabina went from two Ds to a B. They, there was a real impact upon their achievements because they'd been introduced to, well, no, no, I can't say because, but it looks as though this was the impact of helping them to understand how they were you know, to enable themselves to learn. And so I go back to have confidence that if you get it right, if you get it right, then the grades will improve because you're doing the right thing. But, um, but look, I mean, I think it's for every organisation to find out for themselves how best they can do it. But, but, but don't ignore 
the research which says, hey, maybe we understand this a bit better now. This is about using information now to change the way we do things. Preparing young people for the future. Mm. John, briefly, yeah, well, I suppose if I gave it to Simon, uh, he might be able to pass it out to you, and I wouldn't charge very much. <laughs> <coughs> Okay. okay. But it just had a dramatic impact because youngsters began to. Uh, you we just finished with our first group of IGE adults. Yeah. And the kids have started the AS have been in school for two weeks. And we see that drop. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Well, yeah. when do we start now? And AS yeah. is typical. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, exactly. Exactly. So but, but, you know, that's, that's, that's life. You know, they start a job and they're told to do, and they say, well, how do I do that? It's, it's, it's about enabling people to understand that life isn't linear. Yeah. Okay, well, uh, any, if there are any further comments, then I'm very happy to resume my seat and uh, fly back to England. Okay. <laughs> <laughs>